Welcome, everybody, to episode 94 of Diffuse Congruence, the American Muslim Experience. We are very excited to have Mahmoud Abdul-Raouf on the show today. Uh, and uh, when I say we, it's Parvez Ahmed and, and uh, myself, Omar Ansari, co-hosts of the show. But uh, we're super excited. We've been waiting for this episode for, for a while now. Uh, as you all know, Mahmoud Abdul-Raouf is a NBA veteran, um, and he's got a lot to a lot of great things to, to talk to us about, uh, his experiences in the NBA, his departure from the NBA, uh, his experience as an, Amer- an American Muslim, and, and everything, all the cool things he's doing right now on the circuit, uh, in the big three, and, uh, and helping out young kids uh, get healthy and fit, uh, and so on. So we're going to learn all about that. We're going to hear a little about his youth, his NBA experience, his life after the NBA uh, in the U.S., abroad, all these things I want to cover. And I am excited because Mahmoud Abdurof uh, was a childhood hero of mine. I grew up in a small town uh, watching watching him play. And this is uh, really exciting for me personally. So welcome to the show, Brother Mahmoud. No, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, no, we are really excited. And, and Omer sort of wasted no time bearing the lead, as it were. Um, it's been a minute since we've actually been on the show. Um, we, we had a little bit of a hiatus, uh, as I imagine uh, most of uh, most content pro- pro- providers out there are just trying to sort of make the most of uh, these uh, sort of uh, challenging times of uh, trying to secure people and trying to find the time in the space to record. So we are really excited uh, and, and uh, especially grateful that uh, you know, Mahmoud was able to take the time out of his very demanding and busy schedule to be with us. Um, so thank you again. As And I, I echo everything Omar said, um, not growing up in a small town so much, but you were also sort of an NBA hero of mine. Um, I, I came of age in the 90s. And when I say came of age, I mean, in terms of uh, sort of my um, my 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 uh, uh, obsession with the NBA was back in the '90s. I lived in Houston, Texas, so you can imagine, uh, Mahmoud. Uh, I was a huge Rockets fan, huge Hakeem Olajuwon fan, and was fortunate enough to be there uh, when they won those back-to-back championships uh, way back in the '90s. So certainly, your era of the NBA, and and as closely as we looked at and and looked up to uh, Hakeem being a local um, sort of hero. Uh, you were sort of the uh, the other Muslim in the league, and so it was equally exciting. So, uh, but like Omar said, you know, we, we have a lot to un, uh, uh, you know sort of un, unpack, as we like to say on the show. Um, but where we like to often like to begin is kind of your origin story. So, maybe tell us about you know Chris Jackson and 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 his life, and and you know, and and you growing up in the South, and how and and what those experiences were like. Yeah, and I'm really I'm really interested in hearing first time you touched the basketball and, and when you really felt at home with the ball in your hand and all those things. I'm going to, I'm going to be jumping in and asking questions because as you can see, I'm pretty excited here. So go no, for it. No, no, go, yeah, go for it. Uh, remind me if I miss anything. Um, uh, actually I can, if you want me to, I can start, start with that one first. Um, the first time I touched the basketball really was, uh, I was nine, 10 years old. Um, you know, I used to play basketball with my brothers. Uh, I, for some reason, I always ended up playing with older, older guys. And now when I look back, I say, you know, that's that was a huge plus for me because those are the guys, they push you harder, they're faster, they're stronger. So when you finally get to your age group, it becomes easy to play with your own age group because you've been playing with older guys for so long. But I remember one day I was outside uh, Ele- Central Elementary. Um, they had an outside court. And I was playing game of 21 and this lady her real name is miss cookie or miss Asaleta, but we call her miss cookie and she was one of those strong african-american women like she she didn't mind screaming at you getting on you back in those days would even spank you and she saw me playing and she said listen she said come here chris come here and of course you go over there and i went over there she said listen go try out i didn't even know that right next to me in the gym they were trying out for the elementary team right uh, fourth grade. And uh, I said, well, Miss Cookie, you're going to have to ask my mother. She said, don't worry about that. Just go in there and try out. And because she saw something in me when, when I was playing, I went in there and I, I was playing street ball. I didn't know anything about organized ball. I mean, I'm taking it, dribbling through people and I'm making my shots. And the coach had to stop me and say, listen, son, uh, you got to pass the ball. <laughs> right. And make a long story short, my first game 
in elementary school, I remember this guy named Theron Gross. I'm nervous. I'm like, man, what do I do? He's like, just follow me. By the end of the game, uh, in the course of the game, the coach was giving me ISOs, telling him to get out of my way. I ended up with 21 points my first game. And just to see the crowd and the excitement, man, I was like, man, I love this atmosphere. I love the way this feels. You know, especially a little, you know, uh, a black kid coming out of the ghetto, you know, a mother, you know, uh, no father, right? Uh, 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 you know, growing up in poverty, surrounded by, you know, drug addiction, uh, mother having an eighth grade education. So you're looking at something and you're getting this attention from a skill that you have. And now it, it's dawning on you that, man, this could be something, right? Um, this could be a way out. And so that was like really for me the beginning, that moment when they were screaming and yelling. And like, yeah. 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 And it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like pure, uh, not like your college, college uh, co- uh, teammate Shaquille. It wasn't like you were this massive, you know, massive guy, hulking guy. You were probably based, they probably saw your quickness and your your agility and your shooting, right? That 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 they that they liked. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I was I was born with fast twitch fast twitch muscles, being quick and explosive. But I tell you, man, after that moment, uh, I began to wake up. Literally, my regimen was four o'clock in the morning, and I would wake up, and I'm at the court at five. And for years, my mother didn't know this was happening because I'm, I'm not about to tell my mother for her to cut it off. So she mm. had to be at work at two, I mean, at five. And so I would wait until she left. I heard the car crank. Then I'd get up and I'd get my stuff ready. And it's still dark outside at that time. And I decided at that age of, of nine and 10, I said, man, uh, this is what I want to become. I want to be the best. And I knew that I'd have to come up with a strategy because I'm small to give myself the best opportunity to do that. So I'm thinking, well, what can you do that possibly nobody else or not too many people are doing at this age? And I just decided, man, you got to get up early. And it doesn't. And, and for me, it didn't matter whether it was thunder and lightning. It didn't matter if it was, you know, eventually, because I, even though at four o'clock it's not going to be hot, but I played throughout the whole day. Weather didn't matter to me. I was so in tune and focus on being successful because I was so afraid of failing and I didn't want to, I didn't want to remain in the ghetto. Right. And then you want to make your mama proud. You want to get her out the ghetto. You want to get, so these were the things among many other things that were, that were pushing me at that age just to wake up. And I said, man. And, and so I, that's what I did every morning. I mean, I can remember vividly that if you, if you imagine darkness, if you imagine the most intense rain falling. If you imagine the most vicious lightning and thunder, and you and I'm getting, I'm putting my shoes on, my clothes on, like it's like it's sunny outside. I mean, it, I was oblivious to that because I wanted success so bad. I, I got to have it because for me it was an issue of life and death. I said, if I don't make it in basketball, I don't know what my life's going to say because I didn't see a future for myself academically. You know, I, I yeah. grew up in. We were taught those, you know, had all of those books and, and, and taught the value of that other than just to go get a job. I don't want a job. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I would be wealthy. Is this so, early, early 1980s in, is it Mississippi or Louisiana? Well, well actually, nine, nine and 10 years old was in the 70s. Okay. So. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking uh, I'm bad with time. I graduated high school, 87, 8, 88. Okay. So, so whatever that was, maybe late seventies, early eighties, early eighties. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense because, uh, yeah, you're yeah, just a couple of years senior to, uh, to, well, to me, uh, and I'm a few couple of years senior to Omar, but, uh, yeah, because I was, you know, you, like you mentioned central elementary school and I was trying to picture where it was. So you, you, you said this is, um, well, the time period, but is it Mississippi, Louisiana, Mississippi? Yeah. Mississippi, I was, okay. I was born in Mississippi. Okay. Yeah. Now I have, to, I have to throw in. Um, I was born in New Orleans. That I I I moved out of there pretty quick. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you got a Lu- you got a Louisiana boy and a Texas boy. Um, uh, on with you. So um, um, so you mentioned a single mom. Um, and I, I know I've, I've I've heard other interviews of yours where you talk about later discovering uh, your father. Um, but but I guess before we get there, um, uh, are you the are you 
one of a few siblings, uh, children? Yes, Are you I, one of the younger ones? I have two brothers, uh, one older and one younger, but I never, I never met my father. Mm -hmm. Never. Well, no, you never met him, but I, I guess you find out later that he was Caucasian. Did you know that growing up even? No, I didn't. I, um, I had heard on the street that my father could be white, but then uh, I found out that my older brother's father was white. So I'm like, okay, well, they must have been talking about him. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, but I, my mother didn't tell, every time I would go and question my mother about it, say, mom, and it wasn't like religiously. Uh, it was just moments in your life, right? You don't have things, right? You need clothes, you need food. And <laughs> you're looking at your mother struggling and you know that she wasn't the only one that, that was the reason why you're here. And so, you know, and so you learn about what, what, what uh, uh, child support is at that young age. Look, where are they? And so I would ask, Mom, who's my father? And she would literally just put, you know, look, don't, don't ask me that. You, well, go, go play. But out of all the people, and this is what's interesting, because we were writing, you know, as we were writing the book, uh, some information started coming out. Out of all, out of my two brothers, they know their fathers. She had no problem telling them who they are. Hmm. And, but she never told me who my father was. And I remember when I was in junior high and high school, this guy that never used to drive through our community, come to find out he, he owns a funeral home. He would drive by and he would just look at me. And I, Found out later that he had nothing to do with basketball until I got to high school. And then he began to pour money into the program. And then I would see him driving by the community just looking. Not like he was angry, but just like this, he's in thought. And I started to think, I wonder if this person, because he was a well-known white guy. And back then... Like even now, sometimes if you're sleeping with an African-American woman and you happen to be a politician or an important guy, maybe she was told, keep your mouth shut. Right. Because everybody else know their father, but I don't. And so the timing of that just uh, uh, was interesting to me. And he ended up passing away. Um, I never really did a, a DNA test. Uh, I still think about it you know, uh, on and off, but it would be interesting if he ended up being uh, my father. So was Jackson sort of your mom's name, like maiden yeah. name? Or? Okay. All right. Um, so I, I guess, I mean, and then in, in terms of um, any kind of religious uh, upbringing in your family, I mean, what, what would you, how would you characterize that? Deeply uh, 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 Baptist. Okay, so Southern Baptist. Baptist yeah, but not so much my mother. It, that, that came more from my grandmother, my uncle, and my aunt. Uh, we didn't really, I mean, my mother had a consciousness, if, if you will, of God, but I didn't see necessarily a practice of it. I saw the practice of Christianity with, with my uncle, my grandmother. I would sit with them, have dialogue. I would go sit in their homes. They would have uh, these revivals. Uh, I would go to... You don't even hear this this name much now. They, they have what they call a sanctified church. Oh, yeah. That's the church where you go in in the morning and you come out at night. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was like, oh. And it's so, intense. Yeah, yeah, that's that's where I got my my religious upbringing from, from those. Yeah. Got it. Um, and then so so basketball obviously continues throughout your life. Um, you I, I imagine um, you, you you're you're excelling in it uh, as a high school student. Um, now, I also know um, now I don't know where this when or um, are you, you're, you're symptomatically uh, suffering with some sort of ailment, but you don't know what it is. Right. And so w when do you sort of see the man manifestations of that? I mean, later it gets diagnosed as Tourette's, but I know I've, again, I've heard you talk about the fact that for a while, uh, quite a while you were misdiagnosed, right? Yeah. Uh, actually. It, and and for th those who don't know what, what are some of the early onset sort of, you know, uh, um, symptoms of, of, of people who do suffer from Tourette's? Well, um, 
in, in my case, I mean, I know that there's a lot of vocal, Is it spectrum? vocal tics okay. that, that's visible to the eye. Uh, but with me, I can remember having blackouts. Mm-hmm. I can literally be doing something and I would black out like almost a seizure. Right. Or maybe it was a seizure. I don't know. I remember trying to stand on my hands one day and while I'm on my hands, I blacked out. Bam, huge. Hit. You know, I'm, I'm like in third grade. Uh, I remember boxing. You know, we used to set up uh, junior high. We used to set up boxing matches in front of the yard. So we and, and there was a moment where there was a little a, a little light break. And the guy's name is Benny McGee doing very well today. Uh, I mean, now and I went into a blackout. They said the only thing I remember was I opened my eyes. And then when I opened my eyes, he had like his eyes got big. Come to find out after we finished our bout. They said, man, you blacked out. They said, Benny got back as far as he could and just hit you. And all you did was snap to and, and start fighting. I said, oh, that's what that, that's what that was. But I, I, I started with blackouts. Then eventually my mother kept taking me to the uh, doctor. They gave me these horse pills. They were like orange in color with jelly looking stuff in the inside. And the guy actually told me, he said, look, you have habits. They come and they go. That was the diagnosis. Habits. Pills for habits. And there's, I'm like, okay. So I'm, I'm taking this stuff. I'm gagging. I'm trying to find cinder blocks, you know, to put, put them in, give my mother the impression that I'm taking them. And, it, uh, but, but for me, it started with blackouts. And then elementary school, even more so, was when the, the physical tics, <clears throat> the verbal tics began to occur. And it was very difficult because, you know, children can be relentless and ruthless mm-hmm. and you're in class and you already don't like school, but you're trying to learn and you can't really learn because you're too busy trying to stay still so that people won't notice. Right. So that they won't won't uh, say anything negative to you or as we used to say, janking. Right. So janking you. And so it was I mean, those were difficult times for me just trying to be in those environments <clears throat> and be normal. And so I really couldn't concentrate. I made it through, but it was very, very challenging. And uh, it wasn't until high school, uh, my mother taking me to the hospital, to the doctor, they put EKGs in my head, all these things, that the nur- the, the coach's wife, Miss Jenkins, she was a nurse. And she asked my mother, she said, Miss Jackson, can I, can I try? Can I, can I take him to see someone? She said, yeah, sure. She sent me ironically to this guy his name is dr jackson this white guy and i'm in the office in the waiting room and i see him walk by and he looks at me he pauses and he keeps going we get into the uh, we get into the uh the doctor's office he asks me just a few questions how you doing boom, boom, boom. he said so do you know what you have i said no sir that's why i'm here he said what you have is what they call Tourette syndrome and at first I'm waiting for the punchline because I don't know if it's, is it life threatening? Am I, you know, it's like, am I going to die? And he said, well, it's hereditary. Uh, mm. you know, and, and, and he started explaining, explaining it to me, man. And the, 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 the weight that it took off my shoulders, because all of this time from then to until 11th grade, I'm, I'm battling with something that has no name. I don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. Right. And then just to have a name associated with it, now I can begin to tell people instead of saying I have habits, they come and they go. <laughs> right. I can say, look, man, I have Tourette's syndrome. It's not my fault. I got it from somebody down the line. It's hereditary. I'm, I, it's not a disease. You can't catch it. So uh, yeah. that, that took a weight off of me. Yeah. Right. And, and so, like, again, the, the way you uh, uh, experienced symptoms, it was in, involuntary movement. But it was also, I guess, maybe the reason they call that habits is because there's a there's a need to do something over and over again. Is it like a meticulous kind of thing? No question. Okay, is that what it is? Yes, uh, and and I talk about that a lot. Even even you know the frustration. I was interested in basketball, so it was easier for me to to withstand that challenge and to get through that. I wasn't really uh, interested in school that much. And so, but school is such that when you're reading a book and if it doesn't, even if you're reading it silently and if it doesn't roll off your, uh, your mind the way you want it, you have to go over it again. If you're reading it out loud, 
if you mess up on a word, you have to read it again. So say if those two things are in order, like mm -hmm. mine and, and, and your, you, it's coming off your lips. But say you get through that and you don't understand it. You got to go back again. So it's like all of those things, you might have to read that page 10 times. Mm -hmm. But the, 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 the plus side of it is that, okay, when you finish, you know it. But you you spend so much time on a page or two that you're so exhausted when it's done, you just put it down. And sometimes it's hard to finish when you have assignments. So that was the frustrating part of it. But it, the basketball, same thing. You know, getting up in the morning, it would take me sometimes an hour to leave the house. Uh, putting on your socks, taking them off. Putting on your you know, shorts, taking them off because it doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel perfect. Mm. It had to feel perfect. Your mind and your body was on two different wavelengths and it had to feel that way. And now you're outside, you're dribbling the ball and you have about four blocks to go to get to the court. And as I'm going in this direction, my mind would tell me if I, if I mess up about two, three times, if I'm headed this way, if I'm dribbling, I have to back up about 10, 15 steps. Yeah. And I have to do the same dribble. And whatever I do right, I have to do it to my left. It has to feel perfect. It has to come off my hands perfect. My footwork has to be perfect. And it may take me 45 minutes to get to the court. Now I'm on the basketball court, the same. I'm going. And so it, it, it literally, I had so many near death experiences. And I mean, I mean, because you're training and Tourette's is putting this in your mind. Like, look, you know, I would have stopped. Chris Jackson would have stopped an hour and a half into the workout. But it's like mm. an hour and a half is up. It's like Tourette's comes in and says, no, you have to play me now. And this is, and you're tired. I mean, you you breathing hard. You're ready to go home, but you couldn't go home because if you did, it would make your day miserable. It's like your your symptoms would exacerbate, right? And it would say, look, you have to make. And this was every single day. This routine didn't change. You have to make ten shots while you're tired, full speed. None of them could touch rim. And they have to be 10 in a row. And so you, <laughs> and if you stop, you slow down, you're cheating. You have to start back over. So I could be going through the workout and I'm, <laughs> and I'm literally about to die. And you can be on your ninth shot, like in a row. The right. one skims the rim and goes in. You can't retake the 10th shot. You have to start back at zero. So that drill may take another hour and a half. And I had to get to the point where after the workout, because I would be leaving and dribbling off the court and I'd mess up. And now this is the court and this is grass. I'm dribbling on the grass and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be perfect on the grass. Now, pop up and I mess up three times. I have to back up. I'll look under and I'm find myself under the goal. I just finished. That 10 shot after working out an hour and a half, that 10 shot drill that caused me another hour and a half. Now the conscience is telling you, shoot it. And you're like, oh, but you know you have to. And if you shoot it, it doesn't go all net. You have to do it again. I would do that drill consistently two times. So I had to develop a strategy. When I finally got through with the 10 shot all net drill, I would take the ball and I would throw it in the direction to my house. I mean, I would throw it like a shot putter, like, I mean, sling it. And by the time I got the ball, as I'm dribbling home, if I messed up and I back up, I'm so far away from the goal. I don't, at least I don't have to shoot it. All over again. So I, had to, I had to improvise because if I didn't, it was going to kill me. Literally it was going to kill me. Huh. Yeah. So it's like this almost, yeah, involuntary, you know, pursuit of perfection. But I imagine one of the unintended consequences of that is you just become, I mean, that much better because you are, you know, practicing so much more. Like you were, you, like you, like you say, nothing but net. I mean, I remember seeing you on the court, right? It was nothing but net more often than not. You know what? That's, that's the plus. Um, yeah. And that's why I'm asked. They say, look, if you, if you had the chance of not having it, would you? And I remember my grandmother, I, I don't know if it was my grandmother or aunt, but they said, you know, for every weakness, God gives you a strength. 
And I remember that I used to say that so religiously, man, from elementary, junior high. And I carried that with me even to this day. And the older I got and I started looking at it, not even the older. I mean, I started noticing early, like, OK, it's a headache. It's frustrating. But at the same time, man, I'm seeing so many benefits from this thing, because, again, I would have stopped and I, would have, I got a good workout and I would have. I wouldn't have pushed myself to that degree, but the rest pushed me. And it's because of that push. You know, I tell him, I said, I wouldn't change it. I mean, you know, there's a saying, you know, Allah says he doesn't give you a burden you can't bear, mm-hmm. right? And, and, and I really believe that he has given this to me for numerous reasons, to keep me humble, to keep me hungry, right? And, and, and to work on perfecting, you know, for the most part, whatever, whatever it is that I'm trying to do. But, Having Tourette's, it takes you beyond making shots. Now it's an issue of how you make them and what speed you make it at. Not just the shot, the dribble, the moves, the explosion. Everything has to be in that move, feel perfect, or you have to keep doing it. And then you have to do it over and over again, perfect. One flaw, if you're trying to do 10 in a row, one flaw, two flaws, you're back to zero. Even now at 51, I'm shooting. And I'm, you know, I do like 25 makes. So I'm shooting, pop, pop, and I'm working. But if the ball don't go through the net a certain way, and it's up, say I missed two, three shots, and I'm at 15, and I got to get to 25, sometimes I'll go back to zero. Sometimes I'll go back to 10, right? I punish myself. Mm-hmm. And so, but a lot of that comes from Tourette. So I... I, I tell people this. I said, I wouldn't change it. I said, because Tourette's has pushed me where I myself would not have gone without it. There's so many blessings. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thank Alhamdulillah. You. That's awesome. Do I, quick question about it. And I'm just learning, you know, I have, I have family members that have Parkinson's that's degenerative. It gets worse as you get older. Is this something that basically is just managed and doesn't get worse? I haven't, uh, I haven't heard in any of my readings on it that, it necessarily gets worse. I'm not saying it doesn't. I think if you're constantly doing things that you know that doesn't make it better, like I pay attention to what I eat. I pay attention to my exercise. I pay attention to a lot. So I know what foods or if I eat too much, I drink too much. I know that it's going to increase my symptom. I have to, I have to work harder <laughs> to stay still and to be calm. So you you tend to know how to okay I need to stay away from that or I can't have much of this, uh, so I mean, it's possible but I haven't heard that just naturally uh, it's it's going to be worse like with those other things. Yeah, that's awesome that you manage it and Parve- and for those of you listening, Parvez is nodding because uh, if you've been listening to the show for a while, he's a huge uh, advocate of like taking care of your health and, and that sort of thing. So we're here. Hey, I mean, one of the unintended consequences, if you will, of, 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 of having that kind of meticulous nature of watching what you're doing and eating and so on is you look 10 years younger than you are and you look like you're still in NBA shape. So, you know, at the age of 51, like you call. i you a check this week. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious i'm serious mashallah mashallah um, oh, we're gonna a- we're gonna ask about the big three later because he was yeah. he was uh still still uh still got it right well we'll, we'll come to that in a bit so uh now it, you're you're in high school you get recognized um you got scouts i imagine coming out and looking at you um so t- so i guess take us to that journey to lsu then um, Omar already teased your 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 your, uh, your colleague or uh, teammate uh, Shaquille, but before we get there, yeah. So just kind of talk about how that happened. You mean from you mean from high school? Correct. Oh, because uh, you're still in Mississippi, correct? Yeah, I'm in Mississippi. Uh, I began to make a name for myself actually in junior. I mean in elementary, um, yeah. and and I remember Coach Jenkins was he's a high school coach at that time. He was the for the for many years the the most winningest coach in the in the state of Mississippi. And and at that time I forget Gulfport High how many championships they had prior to me getting there. Um and I remember he put me on his uh, 10th grade AAU team while I was in the seventh grade. And I was averaging twenty one. And and in and, and junior high we used to play and they only played us two quarters and they didn't have a three and I was averaging twenty. So when you're doing something like that your name gets out there a little bit quicker. 
I ended up being invited to the Nike camp at Princeton, New Jersey, going into my 11th grade year. And I was invited twice. There was a guy there. I can't remember his name. He was the toughest scout in the uh, at that time. I don't know if there's been anyone since that he was the toughest scout at that time in the history of the camp. He had never given one of anyone a five. And two years in a row, he gave me a five. And one year, Jordan was there. And I don't know if it was going into my 11th or 12th. And it was like this, you know, these bleachers, 110 of the top high school players in the nation. And at that time, I think I'm uh, number one guard coming out in the nation. And of all the people there, he looks at me, he said, young fella, come on out here. Uh, I got at the top of the key, a little to the left, and he gave me the ball. He said, I'm going to, he said, I want you to come at me with everything you have, and I'm going to try to stop you. I said, okay. And I remember getting the ball, and I gave him a jab step. I mean, so fast, and I took off to my left. And, man, he was, like, from the top of the key, he was trying to get it. And what I did, I ran through the layup. I didn't go up because he's 6'6". So I ran through. I just kept on running like I was running a 100-yard dash. But I laid it up and took something off of it. And it went in. They went crazy. And I went crazy. You know what I mean? I mean, not like jumping up and down, but my insides, you know. Mm -hmm. And, And so he gives me the ball again. And this time he hands it to me. And I don't establish a pivot. I land on both. But I have my right foot staggered in front of me like I could jab again and do the same thing. But this time I get it and I take it through my legs and I'm leaning to the left. He bites. I cross him over. I lay him up on the other side. It comes out. He asks me for the ball. Then he tells me to go sit down. From that moment, even more so, it's like uh, what it did for me and I think what it did for people that were watching, because you have college coaches all over the nation sitting in those gyms watching. And this is Michael Jordan at his, I mean, youth. And it was easy. Literally, it was easy. And this was so he's playing college at this time? I mean, he's at UNC no, or whatever? He was in the NBA. Oh, he was already in the, okay. he was in the league. Okay. And, and to scroll on him those two times, I was like, I'm sitting there, I'm like, man, I just played wow. Michael Jordan twice. And it was easy. But man, wait till I go home and tell my boys about it. They ain't going to believe me. <laughs> and one thing led to another. I, I ended up uh, man, the journey to college, I mean, it, it'll take more than the time that we have, but the journey getting to college was tumultuous because there was people involved that eventually the, the police had to get involved when I went to LSU uh, because they were trying to manipulate my mother. Uh, they were trying to sell me to different colleges that I didn't want to go to. I didn't know the game then. Uh, so I was afraid to accept money. I didn't want to mess my chances up. And at the same time, too, uh, I just in my mind, (laughs) I have different views now. But in my mind, like I just want to do it right. And I remember uh, this guy taking me on a ride. And he said, "Uh, such and such offered this, such and such offered this. And these these were some of like the first steps toward me beginning to speak my my mind. But I'm like, man, my life. I've been I've been killing myself, man. I'm not about to let somebody just tell me what to do and then it doesn't work out. I want to be able to blame myself. I don't want to blame anybody else. And when I told him that, look, I'm, I'm thinking about LSU. He said, no, he says, no, unacceptable. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, we're looking for the highest bidder. Such and such offer this, such and such offer this. And I looked at him and I said, I said, uh, I said, well, I'm not for sale. And I said, look, if I, if, if I make it, my mother's going to be taken care of. Because he was like, we want the highest bidder for your mother. I said, if I make it, she'll be taken care of. So I go back home and he he talks to my mother. And there's another lady that was involved that was real close to me. And they were sitting there with their heads down, like very submissive. And I'm looking at this and it, man, it angered me. Mm-hmm. You know, this is my mother. This is and how he's talking. So I, that was my first time walking out of the house. I walked out and I went and stayed over a friend's house that night. And I came back the next day and it happened twice. I walked out, but I eventually had to make the decision. She ended up calling an uncle of mine that lives in Detroit, thinking that he was going to influence me. He comes down. He was the type of uncle that fights for his family, like physically. He'll, he'll fly in and fight. And uh, 
So he would take me to the gym. He would wake up. I wake up, say, "Hey, Uncle, I want to go. Man, I want to go shoot." It'd be two in the morning. He'll shine the lights of the car on the court. We'd be out there talking and playing. And one day we're leaving the store. He said, "Hey, nephew." He said, "Uh, where you want to go?" I said, "I'm going to LSU." Hmm. He said, "You so you 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 know you want to go to LSU?" He said, "Why?" I said, "Because that's why I feel comfortable. I feel the people are genuine. That's why I want to go." I know that's where I'm going. He said, well, listen, don't say anything to your mother. She's going to be mad at me. She's going she's gonna to give you the guilt trip. You got to fight it. It's going to be tough, but you got to fight it. If that's where you want to go, that's where you go. So days go by, not long, maybe a couple of days. Because there were, there were so many players involved. Some of them I didn't even know they were involved. They got so close to me, right? But they were trying to work out deals. They, I mean, it was, it was amazing. And eventually what happened was we came home one day, we drove back. He said, go get your stuff. And I go in, I'm packing my little bag of stuff. My little brothers, every, even when I think about it now, you know, my, my eyes water. But he was in the, he was, he was on the porch and that was, he was my heart at the time. Right. And my mother was like, hold on, where you taking my son? I said, you know, her name, they call her Jackie. Her name is Jackie. Jackie, look. LSU is where he wants to go. That's where he goes. No, you can't take him. You can't take him. She was screaming and yelling, and I'm grabbing my stuff. You don't, you know, who wants to leave like this, right? But I knew I had to make that decision. I had to get out. And I'm getting my stuff, and I look at my little brother. <clears throat> I couldn't look at him long, you know, because it was just, and then I put my stuff in the car, and she's still screaming, don't take him, don't take him. And I look at her one last time, and I, and I put my head down. Man, and I just, I had to wait until I drove off, but when I drove off, I just started crying. <laughs> I mean, heavy tears, you know, it was, it was just so much pain. And so as, I, as, as we're leaving, he was like, go ahead, nephew, get it out, get it out. So I'm crying, I'm crying. Then all of a sudden I get mad. You know how men do, right? We cry and after a while, dog it, you know, <laughs> this, right? You know, this off. And then I, 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 I remember looking at him, and I said, I'm going to make it. I said, I'm going to make it. I, I, I said it about four or five times. I said, damn it, I'm going to make it. And I was so furious and I went to LSU and I had to sign my own letter of intent because at that time I had turned 19. If, if it wasn't because I had failed the fourth grade and, and I was turning 19, she would have had to sign for me. She would have never signed for signed me. Uh, she would have signed Georgetown or somewhere else. Right. And, uh, so I ended up signing my letter of intent. And when I signed it, they put me into this place with a roommate they had to have security following me because they said those same guys were looking for me. And so that was my first year. And I'm training, I'm training, and make a long story short, one thing led to another. And we I didn't talk to my mother for months. Mm. And then even when I started talking to her, she did exactly what he said. She would give me the guilt trip. Like, not necessarily say it, but say, Mom, how you doing? All right. So... Where's a Umar? Home. Right? Stuff like that, right? I said, you know what? All right, fine. You know, whatever. I get off the phone. I wait a week or so, call back. Every time I call, she would give me extra word here and there. And so it started coming back. So eventually, after about a few months or so, give or take, I ended up driving home. And I would go home and wouldn't even go to the house. And I ended up going back home when we were on talking terms and it was so odd. I walk in, I walk in the door. I didn't know whether to hug her or to shake her hand, you know, and then we finally hugged and, and it was just odd. And then after that, she came to her first game, uh, college game and wouldn't stop coming. <laughs> you know Cause I mean? That's cause you, that's cause you're shoot, shooting the lights out. <laughs> yeah. So it was, yeah. So the, was the tension, um, that that she wanted you to go elsewhere i mean is that what it was like like to take this college that was offering the most or like my, my mother look we didn't have we we grew up without anything and right. if somebody's offering you the possibility of making a hundred thousand dollars <laughs> yeah i want it now mm -hmm. right but my thing was what was going through my mind at that age even though i was young i was like man i know okay if you make it to the league they're gonna pay you right you got to you got to perform. But and, and, and I do believe college athletes should get paid. The trade off ain't even close. 
right, with what they're getting and what these college athletes. But at that time, at that time, my mentality was, man, I don't want you to give me anything because I haven't, I haven't proven myself. Mm. And I didn't want that pressure. You know what I mean? I just, I mean, I know you give me a scholarship, but no. And literally we signed. I told them there was a guy, Craig Cars. We still contacted him. He was the assistant. I talked to him more than anybody. Out of all the conversation, what, what sold it for me was him. Because out of maybe 90 some percent of our calls, and he said he documented where we talked about a thousand hours. I would talk to him daily. And he said, I know, I know that 90 some percent of those calls had nothing to do with basketball. You know, I said, well, this is where I want to be. And uh, yeah, so she would have, she would have, I, I forget, I, I kind of lost my train of thought uh, where I was going with that. Um, In terms of her, her initially being resistant and then uh, after watching you play, being real supportive, right? Right, right, man. She, man, I had to kind of tell my mother, mom, because she had to, she was leaving and getting back like two o'clock, something like that in the morning, three o'clock had to be to work at five. I'm like, you got to, no, you can't do this. (laughs) But yeah, yeah, but, but, but she, you know, she had grown, grown to love it, you know, but she started watching me in, in junior high. Uh, Cause for the longest she, she didn't know what I was doing. So, so Marshall, you made it to LSU. You're, you're doing, you're, you're, you're scoring all kinds of crazy uh, your freshman year and, and it's going well and you develop a relationship with your coach, right? Let's tell us a little about that and how he eventually the relationship you had with the coach there and how he it led to him giving you the autobiography of Malcolm X. You know, man, coach, coach Brown beads. Oh, I mean, he, uh, my goodness. Not only does he read a lot, he, he seems to know almost everybody. The Dick Gregory's, the Farrakhan's, people that you wouldn't think a, a wow. pale coach from North Dakota would be in contact with. But he knows them, like can pick up the phone. Yeah. And so he would always, when we would be traveling, he would give us little quotes like, hey, what do you think about this? Mm-hmm. And pass you little things to read. And even today he sends, he's old school, he sends envelope with quotes and a note in it, you know, you, you see, you say, okay. But one day he, I don't, and I asked him for years. I, I didn't ask him why. And not too long ago, I asked him, I said, you know what? What made you give me the book? He says, I don't know. Right. Because I know he used to talk to me about being, you know, about, you know, he, oh, he's one of the greatest basketball players, but he's even a greater person. Right. And he used to talk to me about coming from Mississippi. He hated Mississippi. When we would go play Mississippi State, we would fly in the same day, get the cheapest motel, and leave after. He didn't want to spend no money in Mississippi, right? And and so he had an impression about that area and also about how, I guess, sometimes we've been indoctrinated into behaving and thinking a certain way, like so much like, uh, like passive, Right. And I remember one day I was doing an interview and I'm giving an answer. He looks and he said, hey, just tell him. Tell him what's on your mind. Like he, like he, he was always trying to push you, right, to, to just, just to be up front. Quit, quit, quit soft pedaling. And but, but, but that's the out of all the things that that he could do. It wasn't recruiting me. It wasn't giving me the green light. Uh, it wasn't his coaching. The the biggest and best thing he could have ever did for me was giving me the autobiography of Malcolm. And th- that that's what really began to change my world all the way around. And how long between you finishing the last page when he says only the mistakes have been mine? Because I read it probably around the same time you did. Uh, I was in 10th grade, though. And um, and how long between that and you going into a masjid and saying the shahada? Uh, I, he gave me the autobiography. I went to the NBA the next year. Um, I met this pastor because I was still struggling, right? Mm-hmm. You practice something for so long, even though you have this information, it scares you. Even though you know what, what you're reading makes sense, but you're still scared. Like, man, is this is this the truth? Is this you know, so I was I was I was I was still so I was still at that time professing to be what I really wasn't practicing. Right. So I was in contact with this guy 
He was, he was a pastor. And I'm a Baptist, but he was a pastor in a Catholic church, but he had a protege named Mark James who's from New York. And one day, Mark and I, we were alone without him. And we start talking. Islam came up in conversation. And I said, man, I said, you interested in Islam? He said, yeah. He said, you? I said, yeah. I said, man, I read the autobiography. But, and he said, man, I met this, because this guy worked at the airport, Mark. He said, I met this Muslim brother named Abdullah. He said, we can go to the masjid on Evans Street in Denver, pick up the flag. Man, as he was talking, let's go. Because I never saw the Quran and never picked it up. Never. Mm. And so we took off. There was a Muslim brother uh, in the front, tending to the garden. We asked him, hey, we're interested. Can we, do you have any material? He goes, he gives us the Quran, rush back, open, I open it up. I can't tell you what the verses were, but I can tell you today how I can still feel it. Mm. Read two, no more than three pages. He's across the table from me. I look at him. I said, man, I don't know about you. My search is over. I'm a mm. person. Because what I read in those pages, out of all the questions that I had, what I read, it's like set the record straight. It was like there was no, there was no question that this was it. And I ain't even, mm. that was it. And every, are you, yeah. Are you a rookie at this time in the NBA? Yeah. Yes, I'm a rookie. So I ended up accepting, uh, I ended up accepting Islam in August after my first year. Okay. Because there's not, because I'm guessing like at, at, at LSU, not a lot of Muslim like, you know, classmates and friends and NBA, you're also kind of thrown into this wild lifestyle. Like you can, if you want, you could probably have partied and, you know, this is the 80s, the late 80s. I think I had your rookie card, by the way, the in 89, 89, 90, I think, in 90, 90. And, um, but you, you know, you could have gone that route of just like parting it up with, you know, the NBA, the the traveling. How did you? How did that? How did you just manage like to stay away from that and kind of head in this totally different direction? When there's very, there's, it's not like now when you have ha- a dozen Muslims on the NBA. I mean, there's very few. Your probably staff is probably limited. How how did that work out? Actually, the the partying thing was something that I never really did, even when I was young. I mean, when I was. In junior high school, when, I mean, I did go, but when people would see me, they'd do a double tape. Like, man, what are you doing here? <laughs> I mean, no, see, it's like every blue moon because I spent most of my time on the basketball court. Right. For, for me, for me, all of those were opportunities. Like, when you there, I'm here. When you sleep, I'm there. I'm not trying. And so you, you develop a routine. Yeah. Even when I did go, when I would leave, I would feel so... One, I would feel like I, I ain't getting anything out of this. Then I'd wake up miserable like I had a hangover. I don't even drink or smoke, <laughs> right? And I just didn't like it. Yeah. Uh, so I, so for me, staying away from those things was easy. Uh, so, who, so who in the – did, yeah. did it was, even if I was that person, was when I went to almost every city after becoming a Muslim, people, Muslims find out you're a Muslim, they meet yeah. you at the hotel. So mostly every city I went to, and at that time, all you had to say to me was "Salam alaikum," and you have access to my room. <laughs> so I had a, I had a, it was a tradition that I would literally invite people to the room. Sometimes we have four, or five brothers in the room. Uh-huh. Sometimes one or two. I would order room service, and man, we stay up all night just talking about everything. And some people were in school, some people were professors. So you talking about? politics you're talking about sociology you're talking about history and i'm just soaking it in yeah and this stuff is sounding interesting to me. and then they're introducing me to books authors and so now you know this is my first year becoming muslim i never i don't think ever finished a book in my life right and you told where well, you know during ramadan you have to i thought it was obligatory that you have to read and so I'm reading, it's the season, I'm trying to finish it. I finished it, but then when I finished it, I'm like, wow, I finished this thick book. Mm-hmm. And then I started having conversations. And I started realizing, well, I started developing, like, when you're talking to people, you oftentimes, people think, we think similar. You say, well, man, a lot of, a lot of what I'm saying, a lot of people agree with. 
So what happens eventually there are stages that confidence eventually turns to courage. It's like mm-hmm. you gotta do something with this. You know, Allah says, don't be like a donkey with books on your back. Now you sit with all this information, what you gonna do with it? And so that's how it happened with me. Just and really from elementary or kindergarten all the way to LSU, those years were like a blur. My best education happened in the NBA, on the road, in those moments, informal moments where you can just, you let it go. You can listen. You can ask questions when you want to. You don't have to worry about taking away from. They're giving you books. You read on your own time. That was the best schooling that I had. These, these are uh, community members of all the places you're going to, right? Yeah, just regular people. I mean, some yeah. people yeah. have positions, but some yeah. people just like fans. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Some yeah. Them out. Hey, come on. I mean, still today, I go to Seattle. You know, I got people from Afghanistan, man. I, hey, something like, I'm, I got, you know, and, and Hashim Aladdin and all them all over. But a lot of these people are people that that used to come. And all I hear is, Salam Alaikum, come on, man. And, yeah. and we, whether we're in the lobby or where we, whether we're in the room, we're up all night. So what about your what about your existing infrastructure? So I'll, I'd love to hear, like, you told your your grandma, right, or your mom, and then and then what about how do they react? And how did how did your NBA colleagues la- react? I mean, you're maybe you weren't parting them from the very beginning, but at some point they're like, "What's going on with this guy?" Right? Oh, you talking about uh, the last thing? You how, just- when when people when you told people you're Muslim now, oh yeah, fam- family's reaction and NBA yeah. NBA's reaction. Uh, my mother when I first told her, she was like, "Oh, uh, she said, oh, baby, everybody's got to believe in something." That's good. That's supportive. <laughs> but it's open, open ended. Um, yeah, because I mean, literally the next day I called my mother. Yeah. Hey, so you know, I'm going to ask, like, something, what? Something happened in the conversation. Yeah. I said, Well, mom, you know I'm a Muslim now. Who are you listening to? You don't have a mind on your. Man, you just said yesterday. <laughs> and I yeah. my mother knows me. I'm, when, I'm, when I'm decided on something, I'm decided. I said, Look, I love you with everything in me. I said, You're my mother. You've been my mother and my father. I said, you can disown me. You can do whatever. I said, but I'm not abandoning this right here. I'm going to be a Muslim, and that's what it's going to be, like it or not. She was the first one in my, all of my, she gave me the name Chris Jackson. She was the first in the family that literally would correct people if they called me by my name. Hey, that's not his name anymore. His name is Mahmoud, right? She never became Muslim, but he defended. My grandmother was heavy. She was she was a deep Christian and we got into a conversation one day and somehow the nature of Jesus came up and I'm trying to explain, cause I was listening to Ahmed Didat on the VHS. <laughs> I was just I was soaking it in and I'm trying to give it, you know, explain. And my grandmother started seem, seeming like she was hyperventilating. Like, no, 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 Jesus. I said, I said, grandma, my love. I said, believe in what you want to believe in. Cause she was like literally getting work. And I didn't want to, her to you know what I mean because I didn't want anything to happen like a heart attack. She's been. You mentioned Ahmed Didat, and, I, and and my mind goes to Ahmed Didat debating Jimmy Swagger. Yep. And I think we, that was in Louisiana. Right, I was in Louisiana. That's right, that's the year before I got there because that was eighty. Wow, because that's Baton Rouge. I right. graduated, yep. gra- left high school 87, 88 and 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 Siraj Wahaj was the moderator. I was just about to say a young tuxedo, or he's like wearing like a three piece suit, which you're never going to see that again. <laughs> but Imam Siraj in a three piece suit moderating <laughs> that debate. I grew up watching that too. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Same here. And, same, here. And same, same with Omar. Yeah, yeah. Um, fascinating. But I, I do want to. So we could. I, I do want to quickly just finish on like how did, who who in the NBA was supportive and and maybe who wasn't. I mean, I'm just curious. Uh, what was the NBA's reaction? My teammates were supportive. Um, um, by and large, Dikembe, Jalen Rose, uh, Lafonso Ellis, definitely Dale Ellis. The night that they suspended me, you look at the, the footage, everybody facing this way, Dale was facing this way. But Dale mm-hmm. was one of those guys, because we used to have debates on the plane, on the bus, talking about a lot of things, but Dale was one of those guys that sat next to me. And so I would hand him, I handed him a book called Behold a Pale Horse, right? It's, it's, it's one of those books that talk about government conspiracies and all of that. And he fell in love with it. But it's, everybody's different. You know, this book may be the entryway of talking about other things. You know, somebody else, you give another book. But anyway, he was uh, we used to talk like religiously, you know, on the road. 
And uh, he was, he was like, he was, that was his own little protest, you know, that particular game. But my, my teammates by and large were very supportive because this is something I've been doing for the longest. And I, and I never did it in a way to necessarily uh, down anybody else. Right. I said, look, I'm still searching. I'm still trying to figure the world out, but I know this ain't for me. Yeah. Yeah. This is awesome. Not that I'm down for. And well, I, I re- uh, yeah, that's awesome. I remember. I remember. This is pre-social media, right? So in, in in these days, you do you make a big decision in life. You probably post it on Twitter. Not you, but pe- yeah, like, and yeah. It, right. I remember. I remember turning on, and I had your rookie card as a as a ninth grader. And I remember turning on Sports Center in like November when the season started, and I saw the outdoor roof jersey. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> that's a change. But um, before we even get into the, the 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 national anthem controversy, tell us a little about your NBA highlights. I mean, I, I everybody knows about the fifty one point game against the Jazz. I've seen that how many times on YouTube, and I probably saw it when it came out uh, when it happened. But what are some? What's like your number one good memory from the NBA? Yeah, it's like it's like saying like you were the Colin Kaepernick before there was Colin Kaepernick, but before that you were the Steph Curry before there was the Steph Curry. That's what I would tell my kids. Like I yeah. tell them highlights of you playing because they're huge Warriors fans. I mean, we live in the Bay area, but um, I, I said, oh, no, no, I say, hey, you know, Steph's great, but you, uh, let me show you, you know, like, 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 uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 So what's like, what's like your number one best memory from the NBA? It's always difficult for me to pick favorites and best moments because there's there's so many. Um, And you just mentioned one. And another one was playing against Jordan when they had that streak that we broke. Right. Uh, And and he uh, that's the time that they were. Jordan was playing. They wanted him to guard point guards. Uh, And he had just visited two teams prior and the point guards lit him up. And I'm saying to myself, I'm the third one in line. I don't want to be the oddball. <laughs> and, and, and when you play enough basketball, it's offensive. We take offense to a person. This is not your position. And now all of a sudden you're trying to make a shift and guard. That's like me saying, look, I'm a guard Jordan on the post the whole game. He's going to, he's six, six. He's going to act. Now I'm going to fight you. We're going to go, but he's going to ask for it every time, you know, trying to do me in because this is not necessarily my position. So I took it. You take every game personal, but especially that. And I was just hoping, oh, Allah, bless this to go well. <laughs> right? And it just so happened it went well. They got him off of me. They start switching up. But uh, that, that, that was memorable. Uh, the one in Phoenix when I had 30 points and 20 assists. Oh, wow. Memorable. Nice. Yeah, because he, uh, now it seems like they just give assists. Then you if you – Give a guy a ball, he takes one dribble this way just to free himself, it's not an assist. It's got to be a clear, clear to the ball. And you can pass guys the ball, have a good pass, but if they miss the shot, it's not an assist. So it's not you're not getting guys the ball, but guys have to make it, and it has to be this way. In order. So just to see that finally, I'm like, man, about time. <laughs> right. do, you ever, do, you, do you ever say, hey, if I played in today's NBA, because the game has changed, right? It was a 80, 80 to 82 was like your typical score back then, not like 130 to 125. Do you right. think like you could have shot a lot more threes and gotten a lot more points? Well, the that's, way, the way- that's the way the game is now. It's, it's mm-hmm. like even when I train guys, right, a lot of NBA guys, you take them to the mid range. Some of them are so inconsistent mid range, but you put them at the three, pop, 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 because it's mostly a three ball game now. Even you know, stretch three, stretch four, stretch whatever it is. Um, so now you definitely are taking more threes. You're taking more shots. I think I, I thought about it. Uh, I don't think about it a whole lot, um, but it's, it's definitely. Yeah. <laughs> It's, 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 it's fun to imagine, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, because you can't really, when a guy's facing you, you can't really put your hands on him, right? And it's almost like just shooting practice. All you got to do is be quick enough to get your shot off, right? So it's, it's definitely exciting to watch. Yeah. yeah. Watch and so off. just, and I think, you know, it's, it's really fun hearing and interesting hearing about all these side stories because, um, because these are these are some ones you don't read about on on the news or whatever. But just kind of transitioning to 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 the big story that was covered. On, I think we lost him over there for a second. Yeah. Oh, can you hear me? 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're kind of breaking up a little bit, Omar. Okay. Yeah. No, Pervis, why don't you why don't you go ahead and take it in terms of asking about just the the national anthem controversy? I, I'm- well, yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, I definitely want to get get there. I, uh, you know, real quick, you mentioned um, y- your brother Omar. Now, uh, did did he embrace Islam after you, or you know, how does that go? And I, I guess what I was wondering when you were telling your story about your grandmother and your mom's reactions. I mean, I was thinking, you know, I guess even growing up, like, what is like. like how would you how would you characterize what people thought of when they heard the word Islam or Muslims, um, you know, uh, in, in, in Mississippi, you know, in the 70s? Uh, I'm, I'm curious by that. I mean, is it all informed by the nation? But is it also being informed by what's happening, like, you know, geopolitically uh, or, or at that time? Is it still very much kind of, you know, seen as something within the African-American community? Do you know what I mean? Like, is it just seen as an as, as, as primarily a black American experience or is it kind of, you know, like we like today, it's kind of infused with what's happening more with overseas than what's happening, you know, um, you know within the United good, States. That's a good question, and yeah. and it's it's a it's a combination of both. It, okay, it, it all depends on the person's education, mm-hmm. what they have access to. Um, but you, you the same things that people say now were the same thing they were saying then. They're linking okay. it to terrorism and radicalism mm-hmm. and fundamentalism, but also I got a lot when I was talking to a lot of white people being black uh, or Muslim. And I literally would begin to, I already kind of felt where they were going. I'm not with the nation. That's right. I'm not. Yeah. Oh, okay. (laughs) Because you know, it's this whole white man is a devil, black man is God type thing. So you had a little bit of both. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, and with, with regards to your brother, right? I mean, no, he, Omar. Uh, he accepted after me. My, my okay. brother, my my uh, my aunt uh, suggested to my mother to name him Umar after the actor Umar Sharif. Oh wow! Yeah, you remember? <laughs> yes. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, she just liked him as an actor, so it had. Right. But he ended up embracing Islam. Actually, uh, I. Uh, I convinced my mother to let him come to stay with me in Denver for the last two years. So I raised him the last two years in high school oh. uh, because he was getting a lot of pressure. You know, his brother's in the NBA. He's right. playing basketball. You're not like your brother. Because I would come home and I would see him like not wanting to be around me. So one day I come here, man, let me talk to you. So what's going on? And then after talking to him, he's like, you know, I said, listen, man, I don't never allow anybody. I don't care who it is to cause you to not want to be associated with your family. Right. You know, so I had to talk to him about that. I said, look, you have things that you do. That's better than I do. Hey, yeah, I'm in the NBA. I said, I said, but man, you play defense better than me. Right. I said, you have things that you do well. I said, but don't don't allow that to discourage. So eventually I, I knew it was bothering him. Right. And so I, I, I ended up asking my mother and she ended up, you know, letting it letting it happen. So, uh, yeah, but he, he being in Denver around that environment, he ended up embracing us now. OK. Yeah. Um, and, and so like and if you want to talk about this, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. But like, I mean, you know, is there a process with taking on the name Mahmoud Abdurrauf, like, is there, is there like a story there? Is it something that just sort of happens? Um, you know, are you, are you interacting more with the local Denver Muslim community? Um, I I know this, this will probably come up later again. Um, you know, there's a, there's a shift, right? I mean, I don't know if there's a conscious effort initially to embrace so-called Sunni Islam. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, later you discover more about the tradition and and you end up, you know, um, you know, becoming Shi. Like if you want to talk about that, I'll I'll really leave it up to you. But I know that is something that's that's also a part of your journey. Um, Okay. You gave me, which one? That's a lie. <laughs> we can take it step by step. Yeah, yeah. So like, I guess initially, um, are, are you interacting more with the Muslim community in Denver? Yeah, I, I am. I, I mean, okay. I, I've always pretty much been that way, man. I like to go yeah. throughout all different communities. Um, um, but you said something about before that. You said uh, about the, the name, right? Oh, Taking the name, yes. Uh, when I became a Muslim, I, I went to the masjid. I took my Shahada. I go into the imam's office. The imam had another guy in there. And they said, have you chosen a name? I said, no. 
Uh, and, you know, at, at that time, even though I've been studying them forever, you know, there's only a few names that, you know, I knew uh, or that I've heard. And he says, well, I think Mahmoud would be a good name. So I said, I heard all the names have beautiful meanings. The other one said, I think Abdul Rauf is a good name. No problem. So the community started knowing me as Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. Mm. And it dawned on me one day because I'm in and out of the masjid and I see people talking to the guys that were in there that suggested the names to me. And the one that gave me the name Mahmoud and the one that gave me the name Abdul Rauf, that was their names. Right. And I'm thinking I'm in the ma I'm in the ma'am's office. And I'm think I'm thinking they saw some qualities in me, <laughs> you know, like elegant and praiseworthy. You know, mm -hmm. uh, but you just you named me after you. <laughs> you wanted me to have a bit of your name. But and then I get a book with Islamic names. And I'm like, man, this is what they should have gave me first. Because I'm saying names that I just love the way they sound and I love the meanings too. Like I say Suleiman. I say, man. And Mujahid, Strava for true. I said, that could have been Mujahid. But it was too late. The community knew me as my group, so I just kept it. So that well, was we, we, we love the name. We love the oh, name. Oh my god, I must you know, you know, as it relates to and this has really been my 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 policy with the last question. You know, there's so much division, as you know, Islamically, right? And really when I met Hashim, Hashim was Really and truly, outside of the janitor, uh, 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 at home, uh, uh, at Parker, we call it Parker Masjid in Denver, on Parker Road, the big one with the dome. Um, the first, the first teacher, truly was that that African American janitor. Okay. The first real extensive in depth teacher was Hashim, right, and. You know, uh, is he local? I'm sorry, I, I, Hashim. Is he in, sorry, Hashim Aladdin in Berkeley. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. Right, right. So, so I, you know, traveling, you you talk to a wide variety of people, and I didn't know anything when I first became a Muslim about a Shia or a Sunni, right? I was like, man, I'm a Muslim, right? And as you begin to talk to people, you see that. Okay, people are identifying themselves, you know, with, with this terminology. And, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's always been this, man. You know, I, I look at what Allah says in Quran and like there are things and, 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 you know, we know the Hadith that knowledge is the lost property of the wise man or the believer, wherever you find it, keep it. No one has a monopoly on information, right? And so when I look at what Allah is saying, when I look at, you know, when, when, when he says either you're Muslim or Muslim, right, we have attached to our faith. You know, we put Islam in brackets, right? Well, I'm a Sunni Muslim, I'm a Shia Muslim, even when I think about Imam Khomeini, right, ruling the, you know, the Islamic Republic of Iran. He says there's, mm -hmm. here, there's no Sunni, there's only Islam, because sometimes these things, they, they, they cause a. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking? A barrier, you know, in the mind when you're trying to talk to people, when you give them a label. So now, if you ask me, and, I, and I've said this before, the material that I've come across, and I find wisdom in every, you know, whether you, you got Mount Duty, whether you got Sayyid Futa, whether you got all of these, you know, beautiful scholars that are, you know, wherever, if, if you give me something that makes sense, I take it. But mm -hmm. I will say, with a lot of the books that I've come up with, especially through Hashim and people that I've met, Salahuddin in D.C., the books that resonated with me more, right, that were more in-depth of what I came across, mm -hmm. were those books that were written by people that would classify themselves as Shia scholars. Shia scholars. And, and I'm not, but, but I've, I've seen wisdom in, in all of it, but... My upbringing coming out of that, I'm like, wow, darn, this is deep because they were like literally. And then it came. They were a little bit more from what I read. I'm not saying because mm -hmm. even when you read Kaleem Sadiq out of London, I don't know if you know him, but Kaleem Sadiq mm -hmm. started, I think, or was a part of starting the movement. And he identifies himself as Sunni, but he literally supported and pushed for 
the Islamic Republic, but man, his views were so revolutionary. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, how he got into the Quran and he, he pushed this idea of studying the theater from a power perspective. He said, because the prophet always moved from a position of power, even when he didn't have a military, because he knew that Allah was his power mm-hmm. backing. And so, you know, even people like that, I'm like, wow, it's deep. And, and I take that and I run with it. But when I was coming up, a lot of the material that like resonated, that seemed to be more revolutionary and non-compromising, right, with the right. And that's something that, especially as a black man, you growing up, like, man, I don't look, I ain't down with that. Yeah. And I'm down with the Panthers. I'm down with people that want to fight against this oppression. I don't want you sugarcoating nothing. And so those were the things that resonated with me. That's right. You know, so in, if you're that type of, you know, scholar, and you, that that's what resonates with me more. Right. Regardless. right. Yeah. No, I mean, it'd be, yeah, I mean, we'd be remiss not to point out the fact that whether it's at, at its genesis or certainly, I think, Islam within the black American community, I mean, it, it, it's a protest religion, right? It protests the power structures, uh, you know, uh, um, protests the establishment, as it were. I mean, it'd be undeniable not to be able to read the zero that way. Right. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I find that fascinating, um, which I think really dovetails very nicely into the conversation I think we really want to have as well, um, which is, and obviously timely to say the least, uh, is, um, you know, your protest of the national anthem. And, you know, if you could maybe speak to that, I imagine this is something you get asked about a lot. Um, Certainly something that, as I said, I mean, with all that's going on right now, not only in this moment, but what, 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 you know, we, we saw with, Colin Kaepernick and you know I, I would love for you to kind of speak about those experiences what informed that and then you know and then of course then there's the reaction to it well, I, and I'm more interested in what informed it than I am the you know the reaction to it because the reaction to it is sort of well known right I mean it's anybody can pick up a news article and read about that well w- without spending too much time on it it, it, it goes to my childhood right mm. No, we could spend as much time as we. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, growing, growing up in the South, uh, sure. but, you know, even the little things that I experienced as a child, and, uh, some yeah. of the things that I saw in terms of how blacks and whites would interact with each other, that I didn't didn't know quite how to put a finger on it, but I knew that as a child, this doesn't sound and look right, but you couldn't really explain it, right? Because you're taught to survive, you're not taught to live, right? Just be, you know, this is how it is. But you knew that I, I don't like the way this sounds. I don't like the way this looks. I don't like the way this feel. And so, you know, from seeing the Ku Klux Klan, from seeing the way your mother and your uncles would, would talk in private, but when they would be confronted with a white person, they'd be like head down, very submissive. So these things have a way, you know, your environment has a way of molding and shaping you, right? And so I began to notice those little things, like when I had to say something, well, I saw something I didn't like that I got nervous, right? Especially if it was having to say something to a white person, right? And I, I just didn't like it. And so going through that process, uh, still having these questions, but not articulating or not sharing it with so many people, but you just, you're living with it. Yeah. Dale Brown gives me the autobiography. Right. Malcolm's life and how he goes about things, non-compromising, right? courageous, articulate, like, wow, this is, I want to be like that. I want to not, in a sense, care what people think. I want to be able to to be courageous and take positions and, you know what I mean, and leave it out there. And so that started a, a process of learning how to and do it in small stages, learning how to tell people no, learning how to say this and that, get to them becoming Muslim. I go through all of the travels from city to city, meeting these people, and they're dealing with different concepts. Well, yeah, we're talking about divine justice, divine love, spirituality, all that. But, you know, my mind is more so focused because we've been getting the turn the other cheek, be peaceful, be patient, take your time. Now I'm focused more on, oh, this justice side of it, you know, this revolutionary side of it. I didn't got all of that, right? I, now I'm looking at that in, in a sense of being pacified. I know there's importance to it, but I think George Jackson says something. He talks about patience, but you can use other words. He says patience taken too far is cowardice, cowardice, Mm -hmm. right? So some of that, you know, that love and all of that stuff taken too far, 
right? You lose sight of the revolutionary side, you know, standing up for something. And so those things begin to, I begin to gravitate to that a little bit more. Um, and in that process, you introduce to authors in books, the Gore Vidal's, the Randall Robinson's, the, the Aaron Dottie Roy's, the Howard Zinn's, the, the, the Noam Chomsky's. And you reading stuff and you coming across stuff like, hey, hold on, man. All of this is happening. Yeah. Not just domestically, but foreign. And then this foreign affects, you know, like like Martin Luther King, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Or That's right. first that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So I'm like, wow, this there's a and a law is telling us when one member of the body's in pain, the rest is affected. And you saw a lot as a link. Yeah. You know, and you, you, you how, how they talk about militarism, how they talk about American exceptionalism, American innocence. Like, wow. So now I'm really getting pissed. Yeah. Because I'm saying to myself, man, I'm growing up in this situation and so many other people, working class people, poor people, and it don't have to be this way. Yeah. You've got this small group of people still historically. One percent or whatever the percentage controlling 80 to 90 percent of the wealth. And it hasn't changed. The relationship to power, being included, it being uh, going, sitting at the table and voting and all it, it hasn't changed. You know, so I'm looking at what Islam, I'm looking at the history of Islam. I'm looking at the history of the revolutions that have taken place in Iran, right? That have totally just changed the trajectory of those societies, right? Like, no, you out of here. We got to have a radical change. You know, so those are the things for me I'm looking at. And then I'm looking at this flag. Right. That brainwashes people that, you know, in, in, in just the concept of nationalism in and of itself. Right. right. The concept of democracy. And when, when 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 Islam talks about even when we take, you know, right. the Shahada and you look at the concept of Tawheed and you look at the concept of democracy and you say for the people, by the people. Well, you're stripping Allah's. Ability to judge, I mean, to, to, to be the lawmaker. Man don't create laws. Allah says he sets the criteria right and wrong. So to me, I started equating democracy because some of us will say, oh, no, it's like, sh-. no, this is sure. Because you're excommunicating a lot of the equation. You're giving the ability for man to make laws. Allah says he set the criteria. So this is the way my mind is working, right? <laughs> and so I'm looking at all of this in the system and I'm like, man. This don't represent what y'all say it represent. It represents the opposite. Y'all put people to sleep with this. I'm not for it. Then you read stories about the Prophet of Islam. They said when he, when the Quraysh, were the power factions, right? He said they wanted him just with the gesture of his finger. Can you just with the gesture of your finger recognize our system? Give, give. He wouldn't even with his finger. And here I am. I said, no, I can't do it. Mm. I can't do it. So I'm yeah. looking at these examples. I just can't do it. But this is happening several months before it went sort of, you know, viral, I guess, yeah, four, right? Four or five months before. And it, 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 it yeah. took, uh, what's his name? The, the assistant GM, Todd Ely, came to me. He said, this journalist saw you not standing. Do you want to talk? I'm like, Man, look, we talk about this stuff all the time. I don't have no problem. So he comes and do a little interview. He, he publishes it or whatever. Wait, so so before you go there, so so you, on your own, you just start what you, you say. I'm gonna just sit out. I'm gonna I'm gonna sit when. You, know what, that, it, 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 you keep hearing people say, "Oh, he stayed in the locker room." I didn't stay in no locker room. No, <laughs> I kept coming out. But That's right. I would do because I wasn't trying to necessarily at that time because I'm still learning. Right, and I'm still trying to. Like, okay, I know this ain't what I believe. I know it ain't what I want, but I'm still trying to get at the same time, become more uh, versed. Right. And so I would come out and when they were staying, I would sit and I would stretch. Right. And sometimes I would be caught standing and I would turn the other way. I would do stuff like that. And I guess this nosy reporter right? he started noticing oh, something ain't right so he asked me a question about it and i spoke my conscience and i told him and right. i guess that's Allah's way of saying look man you pussyfooting around you got enough information you're already not doing it so i'm gonna thrust you out there right now 
Right, right. Like this, and, well, and, it's the of Allah, right? I mean, that's begin private. Scared. Yeah. It was just with me. I'm trying to like. I'm already doing it, but I'm just trying to build my knowledge base. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to understand more, you know. And Allah just manifested it sooner by bringing that reporter. I spoke my conscience. Next thing you know, uh, I'm in a. I come to the locker. I mean, I come to the game. We're playing Orlando. When Shaquille was playing there, I come into the locker room and the, the Jim Gillen, the trainer, he looks at me, he says, uh, Bernie wants to see you down, down the office. And I take a quick glance of the locker room and the players are like looking at you and putting their head down. So I go to the to the office. Bernie sits there. He says, uh, the NBA called. Uh, they're going to suspend you. Uh and find you if you don't stand. What do you say? I said I can't do it. I said, tell them to do what they do. Do what they have to do. He says, "Well, some people from the NBA office want to talk to you." And to this day, I'm thinking now that because Silver Sil- uh, is now the he was probably one on one of the people on that call. Because when I was on the call, uh, they began to talk to me, and they identified themselves as Jewish. And when they identified themselves, they're trying to convince me to stand. They said they gave me an example. I wish I could remember the example that they gave me to this day. I can't. I just know my response. So they were telling me a story, trying to say, you know, as Jew, as Jews, boom, 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 boom. And and this is why you should stand. So when they finished, I remember like yesterday, I'm in the office. I said, well, I appreciate you uh, telling me the story. Thank you. I said, but there's only one issue. I said, I'm not Jewish. And that story doesn't apply to me. I said, so my position is what it is. You do what you got to do. And it got quiet. They got off the phone. So I'm so green. I've never been suspended for anything in my life. I'm thinking it's going to have to go through legislation. <laughs> you know what I mean? Take time. Ar- ar- arbitration. Yeah, right. Right. I'm like, okay, can I go and get my clothes on so I can get ready for the game? He says, no. no. I said, he said, you suspended. I said, now? He said, yes. I said, well, can I put my clothes on and, and go sit in the stands and watch the team play? He says, no. He said, they don't want you on the premises. Wow. So no problem. So I go back and get my stuff and I head off. When I'm on my way to the house, it went global that fast. <laughs> I mean, it was it, was, it was global real fast. Yeah, it went around the world and back. I mean, yeah. the team is calling, want to do interviews, but then I got on the phone with a brother that's my mentor to this day, one of Muhammad Alasi in DC and I was so mad at him because I pride myself. You know, there's a saying you give your word, but if you see mm-hmm. something better, you do that. And I pride myself on, if you tell me something, it makes sense. It, we're not perfect, but I'm going to definitely agree with it. And then I'm going I'm to try to work toward doing it. And he ended up telling me, he says, listen, either way it goes, whether you don't stand and don't come back, you're in the right. But let me tell you a story about something that happened to our prophet. And he said he was with his companions one day and a Jewish funeral procession was passing. And, you know, there's been war back and forth, you know, the Muslims and, 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 and Jews. Whether it's the King of God, you know, all of those different groups. Right. And he said. When the Jewish funeral procession was passing by, passing by, the prophet stood up. The companion said, why? Why are you standing? We fight them. They fight us. We you know, kill. He says, I'm not standing for their cause. I'm standing because Allah gave a life and Allah took a life away. Mm-hmm. He said, so you can stand and it not be for the cause of which they, they stand for. And you can use this as an opportunity to, and you could have used it then still, right? By not coming back and still, but we all know too the visibility that you gain from being in leagues like the NBA, and how also if you're not in there playing night in and night out, they can try to erase you from history and don't show you and don't visit. He said, so you can use this as an opportunity to pray for those who are being oppressed and use this as a platform. Man, I was so mad at him. I was mad because he made sense. And my ego was like, man, I'm just ready to fight. I'm ready for Larry King. I'm ready to say what I got to say, you know, because I'm mad. 
don't come at me with that nuance. <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, right, right. right. Then I knew also that if I came back, I was going to hear, oh, he compromised. Mm. And that's exactly what I heard. And then when I would hear that, when they would say, well, hey, so you made a compromise. I said, I said, listen, I said, no. I said, I still feel the same way about the flag. I still feel the same way about the system. I said, but as a Muslim, we, we give our word. But if we see something better, we do that. So this that's is right. But I said, don't, I said, as we say, don't get it twisted. I still feel the same way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Nailing that point home because they would come. Oh, you know, so you made a compromise. No, 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 no. That 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 ain't even it. Right. Oh. And 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 I and I find it fascinating. Like you mentioned, the conversation with Muhammad Alusi because I, you know, um, for example, one of the books uh, that has that that was written, I think, after. Uh, or it was, it was started off as kind of more of like a position paper. I, I imagine you've heard of it. Khalid al Fadl, right, wrote, um, you know, the authoritative and the authoritarian in Islamic discourses. And, and he uses your not standing for the national anthem as sort of a case study, right, and to kind of look at it. But, you know, and therein he kind of argues kind of the same, I, I would imagine, presenting kind of the evidence that Muhammad al you know, mentions to you. But you, had, you weren't approaching it from like a feel having that information influenced if you understand what i'm saying reading those the reading, lot, yeah, yeah uh, all of those uh you know the seer of the prophet the quran what other scholars say uh the information that i was getting about how the revolution in iran all of that came about um uh, those things really began th those things were a part of that yes you know as well as my experience you know growing up and 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 the things that that I was made privy to uh, in my young age as well as in my older age and and just not wanting to be on that side. You know, I mean, Erin Dottie Roy says something, man, that I say all the time. Uh, she said, once you see something, you can't unsee it. To be silent, to say nothing is just as political an act as speaking out. Either way, you're accountable. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm listening. I'm saying, well, shoot, if being silent, I'm just as accountable. I might as well go for broke. <laughs> you know what I mean? Let it all hang out. Okay. And you know, so alhamdulillah. Nobody, when I came back to play in Denver after the suspension, I did not hear one book from the crowd. Mm. Nobody. I heard mm. that on the road. But but two, I'm I, I'm in Denver, and I'm not I'm not a basketball player that just go to the gym and go home. I'm in the streets. I'm 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 going to messages. I'm I'm I mean I love people. You know what I mean? So I'm walking in the city. I'm going to shop. I'm going to restaurants, grocery stores. So I'm all over the place. I'm going to the I'm going to the guy dog on outside basketball court, <laughs> right? So people, if they see you enough, even though you see something on the news. A lot of people, because you're in the streets like that, there's this sense that, man, no, we know him. Right. You know, you know, he, he's not like what you guys are trying to to say he is. Um, so I, I didn't. And then my teammates, you know, they 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 didn't have a problem from the beginning. The media made the problem. Right. So even when the media was hyping this up, my teammates and I and even on the. Uh, with with the coach, man, we were just trying to we were trying to finish the season. We were trying to play, but it became a distraction because every time you go on the road now, reporters are wanting to do what talk about the anthem and all of these things. Right. Uh, but my teammates really, from from conversations with them now, I don't know if they've changed, but uh, none of them had an issue. None of them had an issue with what I was doing. So they were supportive, you would say. Supportive. Um, now, like, are, are you, like you said, you're still out there in the community. You're, you're going to masa like mosques and meeting with Muslims, um, you know, and we, and we like, I, we mentioned the Khalid al Bafado book and, 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 and that, but what are the conversations that you, that you're tapped into that are happening in the Muslim community with regards to how they view what you're doing? Right. Um, because I mean, I know sitting in Houston, you know, there, there were certainly conversations happening. And on the one side, you had people who said, 
you know, why is he doing this? He doesn't have to do this. You know, um, he, you know, uh, standing for the anthem is okay from a theological, you know, again, making either a theological or legal argument for or against it. And on the other hand, you had conversations of people who said, you know what, he's, you know, he's, he's in the right, he's protesting, you know, uh, American hegemony and, and, and so on. So, um, you know, if you could talk about like how you were, um, you know, engaging or, you know, appreciating the conversations that were happening in the community, in the Muslim community specifically. I mean, I, mean, I was sitting back just listening to it all. Okay. Uh, uh, I mean, of course, you know, I was having conversations as well uh, with yeah. people around me. Uh, not that I was having speaking engagements at that time talking about it, but uh, the fact that it was on the table, it was a discussion, yeah. you know, that, that was thrusted, you know, uh, into the public. Uh, uh, was was necessary. So I was, you know, and at least that small bit, I mean, I, I was like, okay, at, at least, at least now, because, you know, you had the argument, you know, you, you know, especially among, you know, because many of us live here, right? And, and I'm sure you've heard, you know, these, these arguments before where, you know, there's there's in the black community, there's a lot of black Muslims who feel that a lot of people that have migrated here, they come, they do more assimilate, assimilating. They want to assimilate into the system. They want to change names. They don't want to they don't want to upset the system. But then you got to look at it from our standpoint. For sure. Some of them are coming from countries that are very much brutal and oppressive. Right. And so they're leaving it and you coming into a new place. And it's like, uh I don't want to go back to that place. So, right. But, but, and, and, and everybody's different. Everybody, yeah. I mean, Allah knows, Allah knows our heart and our intention. And whether we agree or not, we also know that Allah talks about the strong believers better than the weak believers. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean you don't believe. It just means if you take this particular approach, cause you're so much worried about your finances and everything else, that's a, that's a indication of what your belief is. But don't end because you taking this position, misunderstand and then want to downplay this person who's gone through this experience and don't want to subject themselves to this oppression and this injustice and want to fight it. Don't now try to make it seem like what they're doing is 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 wrong because it's not wrong. You know, Islamically, it's not wrong. We're, we're taught. Right. Allah tells us. Period. Stand okay. up. For yeah. Period. And and so this is a right that we all have. Rights that God's given us that man has taken away, has no right to take away. And so you hear these, so these were some of the conversations that were taking place. Oh, you know, we want to assimilate, or uh, you know, uh, they're too radical, or you know, all of these things. And so it was just nice that the, the conversation was out there. Absolutely. And then a lot of people too, a lot of people ended up being being exposed. That's what I was about to say. That's right. Because I think, I think the conversation was a little bit like it also, to me, again, being a part of those conversations, observing it even um, and participating, it also uh, displayed uh, the kind of um, how, like, I guess how, 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 how immature the Muslim community was. And I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. I just mean in terms of real maturation we were still very much in our infancy stage, as it were, again, as an overwhelmingly, by and large, immigrant community, not so much, obviously, the experiences in the black community, very different. But again, speaking as, you know, as as being you know, belonging to this kind of, you know, the, the post-1965 immigration um, and, and the influx of the immigrant community, you were dealing with a Muslim community that was still kind of immature in terms of how to make sense of all of these conversations. I think if, 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 if what you did happen now, that conversation would be very different than it happening in 1996, right? We're talking even pre 9 11. So, you know, in terms of the maturation of the Muslim community by and large, um, we were in a very different time and place in the in the mid '90s than where we find ourselves today. Where we found ourselves even after nine eleven. So you know, that's I, I think that if anything, what 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 you did and 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 the conversations that then ensued within the Muslim community uh, is really a footnote. I mean, it's really going to go down as a chapter in the in the history of Islam in America, if I may, 
because of the fact that you began or the community began having conversations, um, you know, around these issues that it wouldn't have uh, otherwise. Yeah. 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 So, so I, I find that fascinating. So I guess, I mean, if you could then, and, and Omar was kind of going here cause you get traded then from the, you know, f- from the nuggets, um, you, you, you go to Sacramento. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So what happens the remainder of your NBA career? And then now we're seeing like, you know, we, like we, we mentioned Colin Kaepernick by name, but like what happened to him, you know, with regards to his protest, do you see some parallels there? And if you do, if you could maybe talk about what those parallels are, like what your experiences were in terms of so-called being blacklisted, if you felt that way and, and how that transpired. There's a lot of parallels. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I recognize that's a leading question. I mean, as a lawyer, I c- <laughs> so yeah. Uh, but- I, mean, I mean, yeah. He, I mean, uh, he, he took a position, uh, yeah. uh, just like I did in terms of uh, viewing the system as being oppressive. His his thing, what he mentioned, was more so, I think, specific in terms of racial inequality and police brutality. Uh, when I mentioned it, it was more, and I don't mean this in a in a cocky way. No. But I was thinking about the universality of justice, Correct. Right? Uh, foreign, domestic, regardless, um, um, because um, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of. Um, yeah. And so but but also the death threats that he received, the the uh, uh, the league. Um, taking a position on him the way they did uh, by not necessarily playing him. My minutes began to drop as well. You saw that right away. Yeah. So, uh, but I, I would say the, the difference, the, the difference is social media, right? Um, when I did it, we didn't, and I was talking to Dr. Harry Edwards, Right, the one that influenced John Carlos and, and, and Tommy Lee, 1968 Olympics, the Black Fist. Right. Right. Uh, he, a very profound brother, and he mentioned to me, he said, Mahmoud, when you and Craig did what you did, and I never thought about it this way. He said, when Kaepernick did what he did, there was a movement, Black Lives Matter. When Tommy Lee and John Carlos, there was Black Power. They could frame it. He said, when you did it and Craig did it, there was no movement to frame it. So it was easy for people to take it and run with it as they chose. So true. So true. So that made it that much more difficult and hard. I said, wow. You know, this is what he does for a living, right? You know, I said, wow, that's deep. I I, I never thought about it. That is. Like that. But but what the difference was social media. Yeah. That we didn't have that. So the media could frame and control the the storyline, the narrative. And because I received also with death threats and all of those things, I also received an enormous amount of support mail from atheists, agnostics, Christians, Jews saying, look, we're with you. We believe and Bob, we don't agree with this. But the media, I'm almost for sure to receive some of those letters, but they can push those letters to the side and push this agenda. Right. But with so- social media, you can't really do that. Sometimes it influences the media to deal with issues that they don't want to deal with because, you know, there's, there's, there's an enormous amount of feedback on it. Prime example, when Abdullah, the Muslim that went into the end zone and went into prostration, immediately the NFL was like, we're going to find you and suspend you. People got on social media. What about T-Bone? They pulled back. That's right. They couldn't ignore it. That's right. So Kaepernick. And then I had, uh, you had people that were, also, like a, a young lady, I think she's from here, uh, New York, playing basketball. She ended up protesting. Other people were protesting. But you, 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 you see it in the paper, and then it's gone. Exactly. But the media, you constantly seeing it. That's you know, screenshots, posted, shared uh, of all. So those were similarities too, and mm-hmm. that, that was the biggest difference. Social media. Yeah, that's so true. Uh, and then the way, like the convers, like you said, I mean, th- there's a way to frame it that was absent in the mid '90s. Uh, like even the conversations that are happening around, well, it's his First Amendment right, it's his freedom of expression. I don't remember those conversations happening in defense of what you did in the mid '90s, 
right? Um, and again, very little, very little, very little. That's right, and that's because you didn't have social media. You didn't have people being able to advocate for you as vocally and as vociferously as you, they can, and the platforms that are afforded to them now. So, yeah, certainly, again. As I said, with regards to the conversations that you started within the Muslim community, I would argue, you know, you were kind of ahead of your time in terms of 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 of, uh, of, of protesting something with the platform that you were provided in the league. Um, so, so then again, like I said, if you, I mean, you know, if you want to like talk a little bit about how you know the 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 vitriol and the kind of what happened in the league, um, you know, interesting kind of parallel or story. I imagine you know. There was those uh, two shock jocks, right? Radio shock jocks, jockeys who went into the mosque in Denver, right? And they played the national anthem, and they were, yeah, and they had to serve community service as part of their, uh, as part of their, I, I guess, plea, right. plea deal or whatever they struck. Um, and one of the communities they visited as part of their community outreach or their community work was was the Muslim community in in Houston. So I remember I, I was part of a, par- a panel that hosted them, and when they came out. Um, anyway, that's just kind of a side note, um, uh, to, to, I remember that happening right around, I think it was the late nineties, uh, after the, after that had all happened. Um, but if you could maybe kind of, like I said, talk a little bit about how you go from team to team and, and, and how the, how the league is really treating you and reacting to what had happened. Okay. Uh, and I know, I know we're going a little long on time. And so I, I think we'll kind yeah, of, yeah, uh, as a yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to uh, get off because I'm at a friend's house about to eat. And, uh, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. Mad at me in a minute if they're not already. No, no, but, that's right. Uh, you said the league. What did you just say? The, the wow. Uh, um. Leaving. Um. Yeah, I mean, when when I when when Denver let me go, I went to I went to uh, Sacramento. Um. Yeah, I, I played two years in Sacramento. Then I then after that, because my minutes began to decline, uh, mm-hmm. couldn't really get on the basketball floor. I, and I already saw the writing on the wall after that. Mm-hmm. I saw that. You know, that's why when Kaepernick went through what he went through and they weren't playing him, I said, "This is a car- this is this is a carbon copy of what happened." It's like textbook. Yeah, textbook. I'm like, man, this is mm. this is what's about to happen. I see it because uh, that's what they do. Because they want to then blame the less you see me, then they can have the argument he doesn't have it anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's just right. about getting rid of you, or to just about getting you a cheap, right? And and I'm just coming off of <laughs> great, you know, great year. That's what I'm saying. It wasn't like you were. Exactly. You talking about crime. I said, okay. All right. And so after that, I ended up, they ended up giving me a low ball deal. Just on principle, I said, no. So I went to Turkey. Yeah. But at that time, my heart wasn't really in it. Right. I was right. out of the politics. I was having my first child, right? Ali. And I'm, now I'm about to travel to Turkey. I get to Turkey. One, I, I, I leave because I really don't, I mean, I, I go, but I don't want to go because I'm having my child. Uh, and then I get there and I don't necessarily like the setup. And some of it could be because I really didn't want to be there anyway. So I'm looking for little things, right? So I'm not necessarily going to blame them all the way. But I think I stayed there for about three months. Mm. I said, you know what, I'm done. Yeah. I'm mm. so I go back home. I spend time. You know, with my son, my family, that's where we ended up, uh, by and large, I think, establishing an Islamic community. I was just about to say, yeah, so, you know, again, because of the sake of time, um, you know, a, a previous guest of the show, uh, Zarina Graywall, uh, yeah. did an excellent documentary. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people may not know about the documentary, but I, I really would, would encourage the listeners to seek it out. It's called By Dawn's Early Light. Um, it is a fascinating look into the whole 
um, not only, you know, the events that transpired that we've been talking about uh, with regards to the position that Mahmoud took, but also some of the fallback of that. Um, I think it sort of ends, the documentary at least ends with uh, with the fire in Mississippi and, and you know, and, and, and we can talk, you know, but um, but I, I think just in broad strokes, just to really wrap up, if I could have you, because I imagine with all that's happening, not only now, but now, you know, uh, people re-examining not only Colin Kaepernick's position, we're seeing that a lot, but I imagine a lot of people are kind of going back and saying, hmm, you know, this brings me back to what happened in the mid nineties with Mahmoud Abdurraouf. So is there, have you seen kind of a renewed interest in wanting to have a discussion with you? I know there was a Showtime documentary as well. Um, so, so are, are you, are you being asked more to talk and comment on what's happening right now because of this sort of renewed interest? You know that's the way it goes. Yeah. <laughs> Look, John Carlos and Tommy Lee Smith did what they did in 1968. Yeah. They stay speaking. Why do they say speaking? Because the situation hasn't changed. Nice. You're gonna always. You're gonna always. We're gonna always be in a world where there's oppression, mm-hmm. right? Where there's injustice, where there are people being subjugated and all of those things. So, uh, and especially when things like this happen, we look for historical, I think, precedents, right? Like, who has done it? Are they still living? Let's bring them in into the conversation. So, yeah, um, it definitely heightens. Is that encouraging? I mean, do you find that encouraging? I mean, I know, again, it's easy. Like you said, this is the age-old struggle. You know, we're still in the same place we were in the 1960s. Or do you see it as a sign of, you know what, you know, this is, you know, only good can come of this renewed interest in moments of history uh, and, and, and recognizing periods of oppression that have continued and that have been systemic. Good can come out of it, but I, I'm not saying that only good is going to come out of it. Mm. Um, because if that was the case, we wouldn't continue to be going through the same cycle. That's right. So, so you're encouraged to a degree that you see sustained and consistent action, right? But you know how crafty and sophisticated the system is in distracting you, right? Getting you thinking about bringing down statues, singing other songs, at, at, and, you know, showing more black figures on TV and thinking that, oh, now we have progress. You know, Dr. Harry Edwards said there's a difference between change and progress. He said not all change leads to progress. So people say, well, we need to change, change. But we've been going through this for centuries. I mean, and still, we don't have progress. So in that in that case, no. Uh, when when it happens, I'm not very enthused because it's just an indication that nothing has changed. We're still dealing with the same topic, same same exact, literally the same exact conversations. If you go back to the beginning, we're de- still dealing with economic inequality, healthcare inequality, educational inequality. I mean, you name it, prison industrial, same conversation. It has to be a radical change. If you keep doing the same old thing, you're going to get the same results. And so in that case, no, I mean, it, it bothers me. Yeah, I agree. I mean, even some of the initial these opportunities, these are opportunities right. that if you take advantage. What happened in Minneapolis within within a short amount of time, what they did with changing the the the, the, the face of the police, Legislation hasn't done in a hundred years. That's right. So that's a good so, thing. So, so that's a voting on the street. Yeah. That's the voting I like to do. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I agree. I agree. And, and and what I'm seeing happening, and and you and you and you touched on it, which is we we went from those conversations around you know. Uh, looking at a, a, a heavily militarized police presence in in the in, in the urban centers of America and so on, and we're kind of now the conversation is you know what what what, what some have called performative wokeness, right? Like let's cancel culture, you know this movie, let's cancel culture culture that show or that song, and like you said, it's missing the mark because then we're moving the conversation away from real systemic change. So. Um, anyway, I, I, I want to, before we, before we really, really wrap, I, again, thanking you so much for your time. Um, what projects are you working on now? I know, like, for example, I think it was not last summer, the summer before my daughters, but, um, both of my girls attended a camp that you did in Houston, um, at the wise, uh, centers. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. They were so impressed um, and they enjoyed every minute of it. So if you could talk a little bit about some of the, pro- you know, like the projects that you're involved with now and, and then, then I promise we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, 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 we'll let you go for dinner. Well, some of the things have been put off because of the pandemic, but yeah. I work with uh, numerous organizations, humanitarian organizations that do a lot of work in different countries. Okay. Uh, whether it's building wells, supporting education, supporting health care, supporting farmers, uh, things of that nature. Um, I'm also, I, I just, and I got to keep it under wraps right right now, names and everything, but I, I just, uh, uh, we just made, a, made a, a final agreement with an author, a writer, uh, so we're getting ready to get started on my book, uh, writing the book um, on my life. Um, um, yeah, and, and, and I still, when, when the pandemic is over, I, I do a lot of you know, periodic public speaking. Uh, speaking yeah. I, I do a lot of training NBA athletes. Uh, yeah, so I, I try to have my my hands in, in a lot of different things, staying busy. You know, just so you know, I, I mentioned the Wise Centers. Um, uh, you know, we record normally again pre-pandemic. Uh, we usually record in studio at the Hub Nine Two Five. I don't know if you've heard of the Hub. Uh, uh, maybe through the community. Yeah. So it's owned by a, um, it, it's, it's a community center uh, here in Northern California uh, started by a, 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 a Muslim brother. Um, and, and uh, it, think of it as kind of the, uh, like a Jewish community center or even like, like your wise center, but again, tailored and specifically around the Muslim community. Um, and uh you know, we'd love to have you uh, come out to the studio, come out to the space there, uh, inshallah, once once all of this is behind us. But, uh, um, I, you know, again, I can't thank you enough. Uh, sorry for taking so much of your time. If there's um, if there's any way that the people listen, can... Listen, listen, if, if, if I got some bruises and scratches, you're going to have to pay for my hospital bill. <laughs> for, for what? For being late. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. That's right. Please, build the show. Absolutely. Yeah. If folks do want to reach out to you, like, is there is there like a platform that people can reach out to you or your agent or, you know, whether it's to book you for speaking engagements or just to engage you in any way, whether it's social media or elsewhere? Yeah, well, right now, a lot of people are uh, uh, reaching out to me on um, Instagram, Mahmoud AR123. Uh, but I mean, I can I can I guess if you want, I can hang up and. And if somebody inquires, I can send you the number to the a, a book of Muslim is one of them. OK, we'll go uh, ahead and, uh, and, and and post those links uh, when we post the show. Um, but again, on, on behalf of the show, uh, Mahmoud, um, on behalf of the audience, on behalf of our listeners, thank you so much. Can't thank you enough. Uh, it, this was one of those sort of bucket list items for us. Um, I know five years, six years ago when I started the show, when I made a list of like sort of wish lists or uh, of people that I'd love to have on the show, you were uh, on the top of that list. So thank you so much for the time that you've taken um, out of your busy schedule. He keeps us in your dua. Inshallah, inshallah. So thank you so much. Uh, listeners, thank you for listening. As always, if you have any thoughts, comments, you can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can uh, uh, hit us up on Facebook at facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. Uh, on behalf of the show, on behalf of our guest, Mahmoud Abdurraouf, thank you so much for listening. And do catch us next time on the uh, on our next episode of Diffuse Congruence. <laughs>